Classification is how biologists group living things by how closely related they are to each other. The process that began in the 18th century with Carl Linnaeus, who began sorting every type of living thing into different groups, and then arranging these groups into larger groups to show how similar they were. With modern DNA analysis, the process is even more accurate, but the principle of grouping living things based on how closely related they are remains the same. Latest figures estimate that there are about 8.7 million species on Earth, so it's an incredibly difficult job to find, name and sort all of them correctly. Despite this, it has several key advantages. The first is to make sure that scientists across the world refer to living things in the same way. So a common language, Latin, is used so that the same species is not referred to by different names in different countries. A further benefit to classification is that it allows scientists to identify, study and conserve species. This means that efforts in conservation can be targeted where they'll have the greatest impact. So how are living things classified? Firstly, every living thing belongs to a species. This is usually defined as a group of individuals that can breed amongst themselves and produce offspring that are fertile. This definition, despite being the best that we have, is far from perfect, as some species reproduce asexually and some hybrids can be fertile. A hybrid is the offspring of members of different species. So a species is the most specific group that an organism belongs to. Each species belongs to a genus, and a genus can contain several different species. The Latin naming system for any organism consists of the genus and the species. The first part of the name is the genus, and the second part is the species. Different species belonging to the same genus are relatively closely related. This system of groups within groups extends upwards through different levels. Each genus is placed into a family, each family within an order, each order within a class, each class within a phylum, and each phylum belongs to one of five different kingdoms. These are the biggest groupings used in classification. They're animals, plants, fungi, protoctista, and prokaryotes. Let's look a little more at what each of these kingdoms is like. Animals are multicellular, which means they're made up of many different cells. These cells do not have cell walls or chloroplasts, but they do have a nucleus. Animals get their energy by feeding on other living things. We say that they feed heterotrophically. Plants are also multicellular, but these cells do have cell walls and they also have chloroplasts with chlorophyll in them. This is the pigment they need for photosynthesis, which is where they get their energy from. We describe plants as feeding autotrophically, meaning that they make their own sugar through photosynthesis. Fungi are the third group of multicellular organisms. Like plants, they have cell walls, but they don't contain chlorophyll as they get their energy from dead and decaying organisms. We describe this as feeding saprophytically. The final two groups are unicellular, meaning that each cell is a separate, individual organism. Protoctista have a nucleus, whereas prokaryotes do not. Viruses are much simpler than any of these groups of organisms. They don't require a source of energy because they don't respire, and they're only able to in reproduce when inside a host cell. For these reasons, scientists do not regard viruses as living, so they're not placed into one of the five kingdoms. Sometimes it can be difficult to place a species within a particular group because it has features of more than one group. Vertebrate animals all belong to the phylum chordate, which means they have a supporting rod running down the length of their body. In vertebrates, this rod is the backbone. There are five vertebrate groups, and animals with a backbone are placed into one of these groups based on three areas of variation. The first is how the animal absorbs oxygen from the environment. Mammals, birds and reptiles get oxygen from the air through their lungs. Fish and young amphibians have gills to absorb oxygen dissolved in the water, and some amphibians, when they're adults, are able to absorb oxygen directly through their skin. Another area of variation between vertebrates is how their body temperature is controlled. Homeothermic animals, such as birds and mammals, control their body temperature and keep it constant. Oikolothermic animals, like fish, amphibians and reptiles, are not able to do this, and so they have the same temperature as their surroundings. Finally, 
the way animals reproduce also determines which group it's placed into. All vertebrates reproduce sexually, but the fertilization can take place either internally, mammals, birds and reptiles, or externally, in the case of amphibians. Mammals are viviparous, which means they give birth to live young, and other vertebrates are oviparous, meaning that they lay eggs. As I've already said, sometimes an animal has properties of more than one group. For example, an axolotl is an amphibian, but it has gills even as an adult. A duck-billed platypus lays eggs, but has all the other properties of a mammal. And sharks are fish, but they're fertilised internally. And some species of shark even give birth to live young. Classification is all about grouping living things by how closely related they are. A species is a group of individuals able to produce viable offspring, although this definition is not perfect. The hierarchy as classification runs from kingdoms, which are the largest groupings and of which there are five, through phylum, class, order, family, genus and finally species. Each organism has a two-part Latin name to ensure consistency, and this name consists of a genus and species. Vertebrates all belong to the phylum chordate, and the five vertebrate groups are organised according to how the animals absorb oxygen, reproduce and control their body temperature. Sometimes animals have properties of more than one group, and this makes accurate classification very difficult.